Look here, a real classic, a Lionel EM1. Classic engine with a classic ailment. I have slipped the uh, main input shaft to the gearboxes. So uh, a little background on this engine, just uh, from a model perspective, Lionel EM1, early 2000s, when Lionel was pumping out scale die cast steam one after another, stuff you really didn't expect them to make, you know, um, and this engine was only replicated by third rail, um, but this, this beast, you know, came out early Odyssey, um, rail sounds four, and for some reason they didn't pin the shafts on these things, uh, so it was real common for these things to just up and quit, and that's what happened to this one. It died while I was filming my 10K uh, subscribers appreciation video. So that's why there wasn't a whole lot more footage of it after like a, a minute or two. So what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to go through this. We're going to open it up and do some maintenance on it. We're going to fix that shaft, obviously. And uh, I'll talk about some of the things I did to it um, when I first got it. And kind of give you a tour of this era's... Um, electronics package, I guess, and, and how they arrange these uh, models in, in those early days. So um, let's get to it. Uh, this is kind of jumping ahead of some other projects I had, but it's broke, and I really don't like broken stuff laying around. It drives me crazy. Anyway, um, this tender was set up with a Katie at the time. I don't know if I'm going to do anything more for this. You can see how I used to do my Katie mounts. I don't know if I would mess with this. Um, you know, now I like to uh, make my 3D printed adapters that would kind of go around, you know, the, the rear two uh, shell mounting screws. Um, but this looks like it's hanging tough and uh, it's not terribly offensive looking to me. So I might leave it go on this project. Um, again, this is just a repair project with some maybe opportunities for improvement. So this shoulder bolt here mounts the front driver assembly and you can see it's slotted so it allows for articulation. Um, this shoulder bolt, which Lionel seems to use, um, don't mind my thumb, I was doing some weathering earlier. I weathered my thumb. Um, Lionel seemed to use hardware, it's kind of interesting, their shoulder bolts would just fit like standard tools, you know. Um, third rail stuff, I don't know if their shoulder bolts were din or what, but um, you always had to find a really thin screwdriver to uh, fit fit the slot. So let's see if I can lift this out. Um, from this view, you might not be able to tell. Let me uh, move the camera. I'll show you what's going on, how this is um, held held in vertically. So if you just pulled it straight out vertically, it's, it's going to be retained by this uh, hook underneath. So there's kind of a hook and a slot here. And if you ease this back, this whole assembly will free itself. And it's got this kind of uh, cupped washer over the spring that kind of rides on this um, assembly here. So if you look, here's the input shaft coming out of the first gearbox into the, uh, into the front. See, it's um, it's a plastic slip universal coupling, and I've never had too many problems with these. This is how you would um, change the phasing of the driver rods. You know, if you wanted to have them 180 out or whatever, you would slip this out and, and turn this until your drivers are out of phase. And there I go, dropping hardware already. So here's, uh, and then here's the, the front, uh, front plug here and get it out you see that so that's the front truck now so here's that front assembly what i like about lionel and, and uh, mth for that matter with their die cast assemblies is the um stuff is really overbuilt i mean look at the size of the screws they're really huge um what i want to figure out here is what i want to do about the smoke unit it's got to come out for service this was lionel's early smoke unit man i really don't even want to talk about smoke units and what i know about them um i know 
a lot about them, especially this era. And that's why I don't use them a whole lot because they're just, they're kind of a disaster to your engine after a while. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll, we might get into that later. I don't know. This is, uh, I think this is the uh, Gunrunner John uh, Super Chuffer. So you can see it's um, connected to the motor to, uh, it, mostly a motor control to, to get you the uh, puffing action with your chuff. So um, I got to remember what it, what this board, um, what it did as, as far as like, I think it, uh, it, it used the chuff input from the switch and uh, power, obviously. And um, it's kind of like the old Train America puff and chuff boards. If you, there might be some of you guys familiar with that. I, I have one kicking around somewhere. I, I used to love those boards when I was uh, smoking my engines. Anyway, we'll we'll deal with that. I want to get the um, I want to get this rear driver assembly freed from the shell. So we'll work on that next. Just a quick note about this hardware on just about all your three rail O gauge stuff. And uh, anything made in two rail O scale. Just another uh, public service um, announcement about using the proper tools for these engines. Um, they all use these JIS screwdrivers. So they have a slightly different profile than a similar size Phillips. And you, you can go on the internet and just search JIS and you'll find... Uh, You'll find some drawings of these these profiles. What you'll find is if you're just using your you know Sears Craftsman screwdrivers, whatever Phillips um, number ones and twos seem to fit, but they always seem to just not grab that screw head like with confidence. Get a set of these JIS screwdrivers off eBay or Amazon for twenty bucks, and you'll find that they they just fit right in there perfectly, and um, not. All JIS screws are metric from what I can tell, especially with the Lionel stuff. I think they're JIS um, standard heads, but with like um, SAE thread, like, you know, like 440, 632, which is kind of strange. I, I don't know. That's just a Lionel thing. Anyway, I'm going to try to free this main set of drivers here. So there's, there's going to be a couple of screws in here in the... Uh, rear cylinders and there's um two just beneath the cab and you'll see this whole assembly will come out again real easy to work on um everything's so so large and uh easy to see especially as you get older and you're you develop presbyopia or whatever, and you need your readers on the whole time you work on your trains. So anyway, I think I got those extracted. And you can see this whole section comes right out. And there's our big pitman. And uh, let me get this separated, and uh, we'll talk more about it. Before we get too far, I'll show you. This was... um. Typical for Lionel stuff. There's a cab light. It's kind of like a, J, a JST connector. Um, I don't know what these bulbs are, but they're typically directly across track power. Here's your antenna, which is going to the uh, handrails. And uh, I'll just unnut it here. And because I have this chuffer board in here, um, I'm going to have to, uh, get creative and, uh, get this all freed. You can see this is the, uh, I'll show you. Let me get this onto the bench. I'll show you some more stuff. All right. So here's the main set of drivers. You see the whole ash pan assembly comes out, tail beam assembly all in, all in one piece and, uh, trailing truck. So here's our typical articulated setup of, of the day. Um, as you can see, it's using an awesome Pittman motor. Long gone from the train scene. 
Um, they've been replaced by cannons, which um, I don't know if you saw that third rail SD9 or SD7 video I did. That cannon catastrophically shorted and just destroyed the uh, electric railroad board, just blew the FETs right off it. And um, I was able to piece it together, but I don't know what it is about cannons, why they why they do that, but man, I've never heard of that happening with a Pittman. Just a fantastic motor. I think Pittman was taken over by Amatech, and I think they just priced themselves away from the train market. It, it was said the original owner of Pittman was, when it was owned by the, uh, the original people, that the guy actually was interested in model trains and, and worked with the manufacturers and importers to uh, utilize his products, which is kind of, a really cool American industrial story, right? You know? So anyway, here's a setup. Goes into the first, uh, here's our Pittman flywheel. Um, I always felt that all of the O-gauge manufacturers undersize these flywheels. You know, I mean, there's plenty of space in here. They could have, they could have had a, a meteor flywheel. Um, but what Lionel and MTH do is they, they make some mods to their flywheels to host their feedback mechanism for their closed loop motor control. In this case, this was um, Lionel's original Odyssey system, and it has a, a magnet ring, which I'm using here now just as extra mass. Um, this actually has 24 magnetic pulses, and uh, there's a magnetic pickup Hall effect sensor, and that fed information into um, the Odyssey motor driver. So I have replaced the Odyssey motor driver, which would have lived here with an electric railroad cruise M. So this is a cruise M. You see there's a big bridge rectifier on here. There's four FETs and an H bridge configuration to run the motor. And it's using counter EMF feedback from the motor to, to get closed loop control. And uh, basically what you have is motor velocity control translated through the gear train to the driver size. And it gives you kind of like a... Uh, scale model um, speed curve so very responsive very robust these things have been around forever now and it's like they're awesome I, I still using them to this day I try to keep a few extras on hand I always have a couple M's and a couple of the full cruise commanders so uh, I can always attend to a project if I need to but anyway the the rest of this is pretty much um, other than the smoke control here this was Lionel's locomotive motherboard so basically it's it's pretty passive it just it's got some input output wiring through these uh, JST connectors and this is the R2LC so the R2LC lives in the in the locomotive um, and if you watch some of my other videos I don't get too crazy about describing these but um, it's just basically uh, an RF um, decoder for the uh, TMCC signals, and it provides some input output for, for lighting control, smoke control. It takes a chuff input, and it also has some serial comm that goes out to the uh, sounds and also to a motor driver, but also has some pulse width modulation for, for motor control, like pure analog uh, motor control. So... There were some drawbacks to the old TMCC system, uh, 32 speed steps, um, 32 absolute speed steps, but they had uh, a relative speed step system that was just simply like plus, mi plus or minus one. Um, so you could almost, if your motor driver was programmed in a certain way, it could almost have infinite speed step response. So... Um, anyway, hopefully, hopefully that wasn't too boring. But anyway, we got power coming in. We've got uh, input output coming out, um, and that's kind of kind of the old setup. Uh, one more thing: this is where the uh, old chuff switch went in on a lot of Lionel engines. You might find these boards still very useful. Still, I would recommend keeping as much of this stuff intact as you can. Like I said, you can just change a motor driver, and you've modernized your TMCC engine to like a more responsive um, kind of control so you can see it's even marked normally open normally closed and that just goes to the chuff switch uh for the life of me i can't remember oh there it is chuff switch is down underneath this down here 
Sorry about this long droning segment. Um, anyway, let me uh, show you the problem. All right, here's what I'm suspecting happened. I'm going to hold this front shaft. Still, I'm going to try to turn the motor. Yeah, and look at this. The, uh, you see that shaft's just spinning. This shaft is not turning at all. So <laughs> it just slipped. So, um... I don't know how they expected that to uh, stay together. That's one of the only real problems these engines had. Um, I wonder how many were like given up on because of that. It's a very simple thing to fix. By the way, this is... Normally you would just have this um, power and headlight connector to the uh, front truck assembly. And... Um, this would have went to the smoke unit. The smoke unit control was real simple on these engines. Uh, it was just on off from the uh, R2LC here. And it was this big, um, I can't remember if this was a triac. This was like a two amp triac. It was this guy here. And, you know, you could turn it on and off and you could also boost it if you held down the Ox 19 button um, when it was programmed for smoke. And uh, that's, that's the one that controlled the smoke unit. Um, there were aftermarket products even as far back as the early, like say 2001, 2002, that would have been Train America's Puff and Chuff. You know, you could have wired a, uh, you could have wired an input from the Chuff switch into the uh, Puff and Chuff, provided it with power and it would control the motor. And uh, that's what this connection is off a of Gunrunner John's board here is. So I don't know if I'm going to keep this. I don't know what I'm going to do yet. I think what I'll do is I'll mark this position of this uh, slip shaft here or the slip coupling, whatever you want to call it, um, just to make sure. Um, there's a little bit of universal and articulation through here. As you can see, this dog bone is free to move back and forth. Um, the motor and the gearbox is generally pretty fixed, except there is a little bit of thrust. Um, going in and out of the uh, the worm here. Um, what I'm going to do is mark this because I, I, I think it's in an ideal spot. I think I've got some freedom there, but I'm just going to mark it. Uh, probably a piece of tape. It's nothing too fancy. Uh, and then I'm going to take it out, see what I want to do. If it's got to go to the... Uh, if it's got to go over to the old uh, Sherline... Let's take this gearbox off. Take this cover off here. Really appreciate you guys watching this stuff, though. I, I know it's kind of boring and dry, and I'm, I'm pretty boring, but... Uh, I don't know. I just kind of enjoy sharing this stuff, you know, showing people like what goes into uh, having a train layout and stuff. So here's the uh, worm gear coming out. Let's see if I can show you. Look at that thing. That is like, that's like overkill basically, but pretty badass. So here's our dealio. That's metal, I think. Yeah. Oh, it's got a little piece of flash on there. That's metal. So, you know, see this hole? I think I've heard of people drilling that out and tapping it. Maybe I'll do that. I don't think I got any nice, fancy set screws. But that might be the thing to do. Just drill that hole out and uh, set screw it. Let's take a look at this main gear. Interesting that this big gear engages the, the gear on the uh, axle. So it kind of gives you another reduction. Um, to me, to this day, there's still some mystery as to how they assemble these, especially these die cast steamers with these captured drivers um, in the factory. I always wondered like, how they did it because uh it seems like a, a 
like the hard way to do it. You gotta, you know, you gotta press this all together in this, in this fixed frame here, you know, they, they must have some elaborate fixturing. And then, so the axle's going through the bearings. So, you know, that that's not an inter interference fit by any means, but the gear is, you know, and, um, so how they do it, is, it's kind of a mystery to me. Uh, even this whole gearbox here, I don't know if this, that's not a separate piece, you know, there's, as far as I can tell, there's nothing from underneath holding this second section down, this, you know, the, the main worm box or whatever, which is kind of wild, you know, um, but a lot of these hang tough, you know, they, they live forever. Uh, you know, the, the slip shaft is actually not that big of a deal. Cause you know, you're on the, the small end of the, uh, torque multiplier here. And, uh, you know, it wouldn't take much to hold this on, but just wildly interesting <laughs> to me. I just find this fascinating. I would love to see a video. Um, of them assembling these uh, die cast frames, you know, how they do it. Because uh, I'm still mystified as to how I would repair something like that. I've been gathering some tools over the years um, for fixing stuff, but I don't know if I've got the technology and, or definitely don't have the skills to take these apart, press them back together, and get and then get them quartered. That was the other... That's the other mystery to me, how they, how they, they must have a pretty interesting jig for doing this. Anyway, you could see the, uh, down here, you can see that chuff switch, or chuff cam, I mean, um, lives under the motor. I'm going to take this motor off. I'm going to see if I can do one of my 3D cams in there, show you how I do them. I, uh, just... Drilled that little dimple out and uh, tapped it for a two millimeter set screw and just put a socket head cap screw in here and uh, we should be all set. It wasn't too difficult. Interesting that they never staked this end. This is a metal um, split shaft, whatever the heck they'd call it. And uh, it was just pressed on and it wasn't staked. Um, this is staked, but this is, you know, like nylon or Delrin or whatever. You can see that it's clearly staked through the shaft there. And, uh, well, I should be good to go. I'm going to add some more grease here. Okay, I didn't put that dog bone back in because I'm pulling the flywheel anyway. And Lionel makes it easy. They have a nice set screw. Um, I would recommend finding a, a set of mini Allens and carefully checking which one fits the best. Uh, I found that it was actually the 1 16th. And um, somehow Lionel managed to get a lot of standard hardware into these engines. I don't know how they did it. I know third rail's all metric. Um, not so sure about MTH, but whenever I work on third rail stuff, if I, I find cap screws or Allen head uh, set screws or whatever, they're, they're typically fully metric. So... Anyway, I'm going to take this off. I want to look at this chuff cam down here and think about making a replacement for it. So here's our brass flywheel. It's pretty hefty. You can see here's the uh, Odyssey magnet ring. And, uh, of course, I have uh, tack tape on here because I was using Gunrunner John's chuff generator before I switched over to my magnets. I was just having trouble um, getting a consistent chuff. Could have been the way I set it up, but I, I decided to change it out. I kept this chuff generator. And I'm going to try to relocate this chuff generator board, see if I can find a new place to uh, park it on the uh, either on the, the, the main section here or, or, I don't know, somewhere up in the boiler, a little more secure. Maybe I'll make a 3D printed mount that I can put up in there. So I have here the original parts I, I took out of this engine um, when I was doing the uh, electric railroad upgrade. And here is the uh, chuff switch 
on its little bracket that will live under here. And uh, you can see there's kind of a tab. So if I decide to replace that two lobe cam, I do have the switch. Here's some other chuff switch brackets I've taken out over the years. I don't know what these are from, but I it's probably smart that I kept them just in case. Um, Cause I, I really do like keeping the chuff actuation kind of almost electromechanical. That way I can get the uh, crank pin synced up with the chuff. So when, it, when we're on the uh, dead centers, we're triggering a chuff. So you can see here's some of the parts. Here's the original Odyssey driver board. A lot like the uh, electric railroad board, except this needed the feedback from that mag pickup sensor, this Hall effect sensor, and that's it right there. That was the pickup board that went kind of here on the motor. And that provided the uh, kind of the velocity feedback to the uh, to the Odyssey board here. So it was pretty primitive. The complaint at the time was it couldn't be disabled um, in command or conventional mode. I, I think conventional mode was real clunky to run. I, in command mode, it was obviously much easier to use. It was just 32 velocity destinations, basically. And they had a bit of a hockey stick. If you're curious about that, my S2 video, I went and played around with with trying to plot the uh, the speed curve versus um, speed step. And back in the day, when when all you had was the cab one, you just sent you sent relative speed steps. It was it was uh, plus one or minus one speed steps. And um, depending on how quickly you turn the, the cab one throttle, you could send them one at a time or I think up to five at a time from what I remember. So it made the thing, um, if you if you ran the cab one like a water faucet, uh, you could get some pretty interesting response from the engine, very abrupt. So otherwise, these are actually pretty stable when they were settled in on a speed step. You know, they didn't really hunt or anything like that. Um, pretty stable control. It was just the... The speed step arrangement was was uh, was pretty low resolution. So, anyway, I, I found my chuff switch. Um, like I said, when I decommissioned all these parts, here's the electrocoupler. Um, I just stuck them in a bag and, and put them in the original box. So, this will go back. Kind of overkill, even for a chuff switch, you know. Um, basically, this is just a proc switch. So you got this flapper. It's very uh, minimal force click this switch basically you're just closing a switch to ground to uh, activate the chuff and that on this particular board goes directly into the r2lc so i am going to attempt to remove this chuff cam so i am heating up this horrific torture device here and uh no sense in cleaning it or prepping it to be uh tinned or anything we're just doing something pretty destructive i almost feel bad um a couple things about these chuff cams i don't know if you saw maybe in the s2 video i did um they are known to crack and slip so you can get some uh interesting uh chuff effects when when that happens almost to the point where it doesn't work but i've had at least two or three engines where i have found that they have cracked and then slipped around the axle. And uh, so we're gonna try to get this out of here without burning my fingers off and uh, I'll let you know how it goes. All right, here goes nothing.
I can feel I already went right through it. Straight across. Let me see if I can turn it 180 now. Just trying to cut right across this flat part in between the two lobes. Yeah, I got it. All right, now I can unplug this horrendous beast and just clean it off real quick. Oh, look, it is kind of tinned. <laughs> I'm gonna go park this somewhere where it doesn't burn my shop down. Oh yeah, cool. They're both loose now. All right, so there's our axle. It is now camless and chuffless, I guess. Let's take a look at this uh, cam I took out of here. All right, so here's what's left of the cam. And you can see it's it's, it's kind of a two-lobe job. It's It's got these uh, kind of outer diameters, kind of a rail, I guess, to keep that switch flapper in line, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, you can see how the, the lobe kind of sticks up. So what I do is I measure the... Uh, the lobe to the best I can. I'll try to reassemble this, although it's pretty well damaged. And I try to determine the uh, the outside edges of, of the square cam I'm going to make. Now, I have a couple already designed and made. Um, I don't know if the one I made for my S2 will, will work in here. That's actually a small well down there, so it should be interesting. But if I do this right... Um, the cam I make will actuate that switch correctly without having to bend that switch up. So let's uh, see if I can figure out what this uh, cam dimension was. It looks like the chuff cam I printed for my uh, S1 project. Do I keep calling that an S2? I keep thinking about that Alco I just did. Anyway, I'm going to try to print this and see what happens it's uh it's on the bed right now should take a few minutes to make we'll just see if this works i mean just and then if it doesn't from there i can figure out where i need to go so here's the cam i thought i was going to go with but i'm having a little bit of trouble printing it and i don't know if it's because i'm printing it this time in this gray pla um, when I did the same exact cam, this is almost the same exact cam I used in the S1, um, I used some black PLA I had, and I just think it made a better print for some reason. Uh, although I'm using Cura as a slicer, um, I'm getting some nicer surfaces and stuff, but for some reason, I'm just, I'm, I'm struggling here. Uh, when I went to clean these holes out, I ended up splitting the sides, and you can see the evidence of that there. So I thought, well... Why don't I try something a little different? Why don't I try this slip over snap on cam, C shaped cam here? It's got the same running surface, same dimensions, um, and it worked really good. Uh, snapped right over the axle and, and, and held snug. And the idea was that I could turn it to get the chuff phasing I want, and then I could put a spot of uh, CA in there and hold it on. But this gap was, was pretty big. The axle's five millimeter, and I made a four millimeter gap. I didn't think I could go any narrower, but anyway, it would catch the flapper of that uh, chuff switch, which for some reason I can't find right now in this mess, um, if it was going in reverse. So I thought, well, no big deal. I could just print a, uh, you know, like a gap filler piece. But then I was like, well, if this is going to be a two-piece cam like the other one, let me try something a little different. So I came up with this. It's basically the full cam without the screw holes, without the gap but just sliced on the 45 um, 
And the idea is when you put it together like that, you create the cam. And then what you get is you get a running face that won't have any interference for the switch. So I'm gonna try snapping this on and, and see if this idea works. The one thing I like about the print, uh, it's another like 18 minute print if that. Um, the best part of the print is the actual running surface. So I get some nice clean radiuses here, or radii or whatever, to uh, actuate the switch without bouncing it. So I'm gonna try snapping this over the axle and uh, seeing how it works. So there's the first piece snapped in place. And you can see the idea. Now I'll just spin it over. You can see how it holds on to the axle there. So now if I take this guy here and push it straight down should have my two-piece cam. I'll probably, ooh, it almost fell into place. Probably need uh, both hands for this. I've been, I had to push the other one on with a screwdriver handle, so let me uh, try that real quick. <laughs> wow, that was kind of exciting. So there it is. Um, I'm going to see, first of all, about the phasing. You can see the clearance. It's very tight in there. I probably could have cleaned that a little better, but I want to see, uh, just see for experimental purposes. It's pretty trivial to print additional copies if I ruin this, but let's just see how this works. I'm going to try to push them together a little better. I'm pretty close. I don't know if it'll trigger backwards. Eh, it's always a little out of phase sometimes going backwards. Yeah, it looks like it wants a trigger on a 45 it's going in reverse. I probably shouldn't be so worried because this isn't articulated. And there's so much noise with the uh, simulated, sorry, simulated chuffing that I don't know. I'm just doing it because I can, I guess. I don't know. I'm weird. Well, I'm definitely getting four chuffs, and they're pretty close to being on the dead centers. Um, so I don't know. It's not the prettiest thing right now. If I could get a more accurate shape, I'd probably be a little happier, but I think uh, it's pretty promising. So, you know, we've got a constant surface for the switch to run on. And uh, it won't get hung up anywhere. So that's cool. I could just get those two halves together a little better. Um, I also wanted to make sure that the thing stayed square too, so I wasn't getting like uh, an off camber sounding chuff. As you can see, I kind of went down the rabbit hole real deep on this chuff cam, just trying to perfect them, um, not only for this project, but for future ones. So, I'd switched out my PLA to this, this black PLA I was using earlier, which I think gave me better detail, but it could just be in my imagination. I don't know. I think uh, these solid prints are, are very similar. So here's the C-shaped cam. And what I was doing was printing these vertically, and I was getting this little bit of uh, kind of elephant's foot on the first few layers. So I was kind of getting... Uh, I was losing some of the width of these initial prints. So what I ended up doing after switching to the black PLA was I decided to try printing them on a raft, which preserved the, uh, the width of, of the cam, which is actually being printed in the Z axis. I also played around with the, the print 
for better hole clearance. Um, and I think the black PLA actually rendered that out pretty nicely. So these are the uh, PLA prints and usable, I think. Um, I was playing around after setting it up for raft. I was having trouble getting Cura to give me 100% uh, fill parts. For some reason, it kept hollowing them out and ended up with a couple of these. Um, look how nice that renders it out, though. It's pretty cool. Uh, still, still usable. Um, still durable, I, I feel. But I wanted a solid part, kind of like what I was making initially. And I, I did eventually get them. I think this one here is a little more solid. Um, anyway, you can see my resin versions, which are rendered almost perfectly, uh, almost too perfect, because some of the initial ones I did, I did with a five millimeter axle. And the one that's in here, to get it to snug on that axle, I had to put some tape inside, as you can see on this one. So this is the final print, final design. I tightened up the axle a little, a little bit down to like 4.9 millimeter. And um, I opened up the holes for the hardware. So I'm, like I said, I'm using this stuff I found off Amazon last year. I'd like to find some more. I could probably just stick with finding some M1s, maybe six, even seven millimeters long. That'd be great for these guys. I don't want to countersink that head in there any more than I have to. So that's where we're at. I want to wire it up and uh, start reinstalling the boards here. I'm going with this resin printed chuff cam. Since it's in there, I don't feel like removing it. I got most everything back together. And you can see we're chuffing on the quarters and very reliably. bit out of phase when going in reverse I haven't figured out how to get that perfect I'm not gonna sweat it but this is good enough especially on an articulated locomotive you can hear that famous Lionel heartbeat double articulated chuff or whatever some people like it some don't I think it's fine I mean you're talking 20 something year old rail sounds here, you know. But it should be interesting to uh, see what the durability is on this, on this cam. Um, these cherry switches, I just looked it up. The actuating force is like one ounce on that little flapper. Um, I think these switches are rated for, I don't know, a million cycles. So, it's a million chuffs. Do the math, I guess. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna try to get this back together. I figured out why the smoke unit wasn't working. And uh, I'm gonna get into that here in a minute. Well, here's your classic early 2000s Lionel 8057 smoke unit. Pretty basic unit. Hopefully this little segment here will explain why I don't run smoke that much. Even the best smoke, and the best smoke is not smoke. It's just atomized, vaporized mineral oil with some scent in there, which when heated and vaporized turns into just this stuff. Um, you see the oily residue everywhere, and this stuff just leaks everywhere. But even in a healthy smoking, and this is one I modified to run hotter, you could just see what happens. I believe this element's still good. I'm gonna test it out, but you can see what happens. And this engine wasn't smoked a lot. In fact, I don't think I ever videoed this thing smoking. Um, so you can see what happens to the batting and all this stuff. Anyway, here's what I used to do with these smoking is besides putting a hotter element in there, these old stock units would cook these boards as you could imagine. Um, 
get roughly half track power to these things. If you watch my uh, transfer diesel video, I did a segment, probably a long-winded segment on some basic TMCC controls with that little TMCC test rig I made. And I showed you when you program the R2LC here for smoke, how this behaves. Um, at one time, Lionel had like a speed-related smoke boost feature and then it kind of went away. So when your engine didn't smoke that good, you just laid on the smoke boost button with the old cab one. You'd hold that aux one nine button down until you basically cooked the, cooked the uh, element and there was like a sleeve over it. I, I actually might have one of these in my parts boxes. Let's see if I can find one, how they look from the factory. You can compare. This wasn't even that heavily used, but man, look at that. Here's an unused Lionel 8057. That's what I call them anyway, because that was the number screened on there. I forgot the part number. I'm not even sure these are available anymore from Lionel. I bought a couple for my uh, smoke parts supply. And um, so the original one looked like this. So you can see just the raw board. Here's your regulator circuit. Um, this would be connected to your motor. Um, Here's your element, 27 ohm, and they put this ridiculous sock on here, and that was the first thing you'd take off. And uh, like I said, I used to like putting heat tape under there. Obviously, you know, you'd cut the heat tape out so you don't short anything out, but it just protected the board and reflected the heat back onto the uh, batting where it belonged. So the old idea was MTH made some 15 ohm elements, and I'd use those. Um, cause at 27 ohms, that's about, about roughly three Watts. If this was getting half track power all the time with the, uh, MTH element, you know, you could, uh, get about five Watts worth of power, um, heat performance out of this thing. So I do believe this element's shot though. I'm measuring 40 ohms, so I'm going to change it out anyway. For some reason I have these Lionel 27 ohm ones. And these are quite a bit different than the original Lionel 27 ohms. If you can see this, this is like a ceramic. Um, see, I got one here. If you don't mind me rooting around in my parts. This is kind of what the original Lionel ones look like. If you're really devious, you could uh, unwrap this nichrome wire, you know, and <laughs> maybe tie it to one end of this resistor. I mean, you could Frankenstein these units pretty good. Problem is, like, this, this just happens. You know, this, it would just happen faster that you burn this all up. It's just it's kind of nasty. So I'm going to see if I can repack it, get it working anyway so it's working. Um, this engine is really easy to access the smoke unit on, so uh, maybe I can clean it up and maybe I'll smoke it for you guys because I know everybody asked me to smoke my trains, and I'm like, you know what? Nothing against you smoking your trains. But I know all about smoke, and that's why I don't run it that often. So I don't want to lecture anybody on that. I'm, like, really all about personal freedom. You know, you're free to spray oil all over your nice trains. Uh, I'm going to choose to not do that so much. And uh, anyway, let's see if we can clean this up and get it working right. All right, you want to smoke. So that's the classic uh, MTH 15 ohm element. So that's about five watts worth of power there. Um, actually, not on this transformer. That's a little less. I don't even dare run the smoke boost. I'll try it anyway. What the heck? Yeah, that's insane. trying to keep that keep that shaft from flapping around back there all right fix the smoke 
think I'm going to uh, do something about this um, wiring, though. I want to clean it up. I want to see if I can find a better place to mount this this uh, chuffer board here. You ever see that rhinoceros video? That's what that reminds me of. <laughs> So here's uh, Gunrunner John's Super Chuffer. And I think it needs a better home than its little uh, floppy uh, sleeping bag I made for it out of electrical tape. I'm going to try to mount it up inside the boiler shell. And uh, I'm going to 3D print like a little retainer for it. I'm going to show you where it's going to go. So here's the EM1 shell. And my thoughts are to devise a way to mount that super chuffer board up inside the top of this boiler shell, clear of all the electronics from the main section, the main driver section, somewhere in between there. I think there's plenty of space here. So I was gonna use this screw. I think it's holding on this, this front throttle dome. It's gonna use that to create a mount that'll kind of put the super chuffer board somewhere in here. And then um, what I will do is come up with a way to uh, electrify the whole works without the use of a permanently connected whip. I was gonna make something with some JST connectors so I could unplug it. So if I do remove this main section again, I can simply unplug the super chuffer and leave it intact with a smoke unit. This is where the smoke unit mounts. It's a real easy setup here. But I want to clean up that wiring. And I think this would be the best way to do it. Yeah, so here's a rough fit up. You can kind of see where everything's going to land. So the smoke unit. Like I said one of the easiest smoke units to service. Mounts in like this. And I got plenty of room here, so I'm going to target the bottom of this front sand dome as the, uh, the location for that super chuffer mount. This was my general idea for mounting the uh, super chuffer in here. So I use this, like I said, I use this screw here. To make this kind of paddleboard looking thing. Um, this is the second print. I just made the uh, made this section a little deeper. So as you can see it fits the board and uh, what I'll do is probably just double side tape it in there. If I was really slick I could have made some like um, locking tabs so when you push the board down over it it would have captured it um, without applying any adhesive but I'm not too worried about it. I don't think it's gonna go anywhere. As you can see, I also made some JST connectors to uh, take the inputs and the outputs to the board and, and uh, this goes to the motor. And uh, you have track power, you have the chuff input, that yellow wire, and that black wire there is the output to the uh, cab light and uh, here's what my wiring harness looks like. So this, this original connector was for the, the front driver assembly, third rail, outside rail pickup, and uh, headlight. And I jumped off there to go to my super chuffer. This is the actual just element power basically from the uh, R2LC. So this being the Super Chuffer 1, Rev 2, it doesn't have the, uh, the R2LC output sense. So I, instead of trashing the board, I, I do have some Super Chuffer 2s, but I'm not going to use them uh, un, until I have a fresh install to do. I'm just going to continue to use this. The, the only hassle with this is you have to shut off track power if you want to refill the uh, smoke unit, which hopefully... <laughs> won't be doing that often um anyway i'm just gonna install this in here and start putting this back together 
I also took the opportunity to uh, clean up the wiring a little bit. So as you can see, we're getting ready to drop the uh, main section back in. And uh, hopefully this all works out. Got plenty of length, I think, on these uh, connectors. So let's get it back together. All right, so here's everything in place. You see now everything's uh, kind of cord and plug connected here. So, you know, I can service a smoke unit by disconnecting the motor from the uh, super chuffer and disconnecting the power from the uh, motherboard. If you notice the, the original motor connector is not used. So that five volt regulator is just hanging out doing nothing. So pretty clean setup for what it is. I always try to imagine what's going on with my wiring after I stuff everything back into the shell, you know, and some of it's not very controllable. So you try to do a good job tucking it all back in there. Here's the bottom of that motherboard. It's kind of interesting. If you notice, the through holes are set up to almost directly host a chuff switch. And I'm sure there's a few engines Lionel built in the past that the chuff switch went right on there. But not in this case. The other thing is I'm going to decommission my reed switch. If you can see the magnets. Hey, you can see the magnets on the back of this driver. Um, sometimes you can get away with that on these more solid drivers where you won't see the magnets through the spokes. But I'm going to decommission this and clean it up, try to get the CA out of here and, and try not to destroy the uh this is probably a glass reed switch i'm now using those plastic ones more often when i want to pick up a magnet so anyway we should be in uh, pretty good shape here all right so everything's back together now and you can see here we're uh, puffing and chuffing Pretty good. This is just that 16 volts track power too, so. Anyway, a uh, neat feature of the super chuffer puffer is that uh, it controls the cab light. So as soon as you start rolling, it turns off. They're pretty cool. I'm thinking here I might want to do a few little cosmetic things. I'm probably going to touch up some of the weathering, as you can see. Things got a little chipped up on the uh, running gear here. No, no big deal. Um, just going to dust it, clean it up, see if there's anything else I can add. But it's generally a pretty okay weathering job. Um, what I want to do is address these uh, class lights. I filled them at one time with probably gallery glass, and that's why they kind of went concave on us. I do have some Lionel lenses I ordered from the support site. I don't know if they'll fit, but what I got to do is clean this stuff out. So I'm going to see if the ones I got fit in here. If not, I may have to uh, maybe resin print some out of clear. And... uh See if I can't make those look a little more, uh, I don't know, a little crisp, a little more visually enticing, I guess. Here's what I came up with on these class lights. See this little pile of boogers here is the uh, gallery glass that I dug out with a drill bit. Just twisted it through there. Stuff stays kind of rubbery. Anyway, that's what these look like. As you probably know, I put a big LED under there. I'm not going to light these, but I am going to leave them hollow. Um, the gallery glass did tend to fill them, but as you can see, it kind of turned um, concave. These are the little Lionel lenses I got. I got two different sizes, but they didn't quite fit in here right. Lionel will put these lenses in certain things. Like I think most of their JLC engines had them. Um, everything else just kind of had a, a bare LED inside these rather okay, nice castings, you know? So 
I resin printed these with some clear resin. And uh, it's just a two millimeter cylinder with this, this kind of cap to match this diameter. So um, I'm going to go with these and glue them into the other one and uh, probably just touch them with a little bit of gloss maybe to uh, get rid of this kind of dullness. I don't know. Um, I should probably paint these black first before putting them on. Well, I'm thinking they look better than what I had. I might be inclined to uh, maybe forego the uh, button head. That's what I kind of copied from Lionel. They had this I don't know if you can see, but they, they kind of put this button head over there, so it kind of convexes out a bit. Anyway, I think it looks better than what I had. I think I'm just going to run with it. So I think we're ready for uh, a layout run. See if my repairs have taken the uh, slippy shaft and the blown out smoke unit. And uh, there were some opportunities for instances of improvement. Some of my old methods have been improved upon. So, all right, let's go get it out in the layout and find something for it to pull. So the mighty EM-1 has been returned to the layout. And it's time to fire it up and see what we got here. Let's put some track power to it. Let's listen to it roar. Classic Rail Sounds 4 right there. I'm not that big a fan of the uh, old crew talk, but it was kind of cool that they recorded cab numbers and stuff like that. Anyway, let's fire up the smoke unit. Let it warm up for a second. I can see it getting that 15 ohm Resistor warmed up. Oh yeah, it's smoking pretty good. Let's uh, let's quit doing that. Let's go. Let's go hook up to that train. So uh, let's move it out. Man, it's smoking pretty good. Uh, one more thing, in my quest to get proper cabooses for all my motive power and with my B&O fleet slowly growing, I found this nice uh, Sunset i5 model and uh, I plan on painting it and uh, setting it up soon. I got some decals on order and uh, maybe someday 
you'll see it rolling around the layout. So to conclude this video, I just want to show you what hot smoke fluid does to a flat weathered finish. So you can see the uh, oil just tends to 
stick very well to this flat finish and then just creep along. So I've got my work cut out for me to clean this engine up eventually. It does have to get some weathering touched up. Um, on the engineer side, you may have noticed in some of the run bys, um, drive rods are pretty well chipped up. Not unusual. Um, I just clean them up with lacquer thinner and then just uh, respray it. Um, I will be doing another project here, hopefully pretty soon, where I'll have the paint shop set up again. So I'll just cycle this engine through. But uh, I think I'm just going to enjoy the engine now. It's going to be uh, going back to its smokeless state. Hopefully I can get it cleaned up. And uh, I hope you found this video kind of interesting. Sorry they're so long. I just can't seem to make a short video anymore. You, you see, I just I take you along for the ride try to show you all the uh, little experiments I do and stuff. Anyway, we'll uh, see you next time.